So today on our episode of Learning Unboxed, I'm really excited because we get to have a conversation with one of my favorite people, Dr. Jose More. Um, Jose is going to talk with us today about his work uh, sort of changing the diversity and opportunity um, in science, um, particularly for students. Um, a lot of work with some of our littlest learners, which is near and dear to my heart. So welcome to the program, Jose. Thank you, Annalise. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, it, the pleasure is certainly um, all mine. And so just for a little uh, background um, for our listeners who come to us from all over the world. Um, so Jose Mora, Dr. Jose More, um, is um, an MD um, and is also known as the first intergalactic doctor, which we will get him to share with us a little bit more about what that means. He is also a leader in technology innovation. And Dr. More is also the founder and CEO of Ad Astra Media, a STEAM edutainment company that provides role models and educational STEAM content to encourage more diversity in STEM and STEM and STEAM fields. And so, um, you know, that work is pretty all encompassing, uh, which is one of the things that I love about working with Jose. So let's get started with digging right in um, here, Jose, in particular, talking about this whole idea of what does it mean to be an intergalactic doctor? Because I know everybody gets super excited about, they're like, what is this thing? Um, and I think that that's a great place to start. So, you know, how did you, how did you, how did you come up with the work that you're doing? Because your career is pretty diverse. Verse. Yeah. Um, well, thank you very much, Dr. Corbin. I really appreciate <laughs> it. Um, so the way it's funny that you start with uh, intergalactic doctor, because that's usually uh, something mm -hmm. that a lot of people want to know about. Um, the way it came up, actually, I'm a physician by formal training. I was born in Puerto Rico and moved to the States. <clears throat> After I studied medicine, I started studying artificial intelligence uh, and it combined the, the two worlds of technology and medicine. And that ended up uh, allowing me to work for IBM Watson as associate chief health officer. And then after I left IBM, I started working in all sorts of technology fields that opened up a lot of opportunities in, in my career. I've, I was able to work with the Hyperloop, uh, Elon Musk kind of high-speed rail project. I've been able to work on um, with NASA on several projects uh, that are ongoing, um, as well as with the, the UN and the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And that combination of me being a physician, an MD, with working on really kind of cutting edge technology from carbon recycling to additive manufacturing. Um, and someone ended up writing an article about me and, and re referencing me that I was essentially in their words, the first intergalactic doctor. That's, that's the way, that's the way it came about. Um, but I had no idea actually about this article. I didn't sit for this article. I didn't, I had no concept about this article uh, until a friend of mine sent it to me. And he was like, he was joking. He's like, Hey, you know, uh, intergalactic doctor how's you know how how are your referrals up on mars like and i was like what are you talking about it was an old buddy from med school and um and he's like haven't you seen this article and i guess i came up on his news feed or something and i saw it i read it i thought it was funny i didn't think anything of it um but then later i think it was maybe two years later after the article came out i was sitting being interviewed um uh, for univision spanish network um mm -hmm. uh television station and the, the interviewer at the time, that was the very first thing that came up. And this was like a year or two years after the article. And they're like, so tell us about being the first intergalactic doctor. And I was kind of <laughs> taken back. I was like, uh, I thought it was a pretty obscure article. I didn't think anyone would bring that up. Uh, but since then, it's just mm -hmm. it's just kind of something that's uh, picked up popularity. So we decided to, to use it. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually turned it into a, a cartoon character. And now Dr. Intergalactic. Um, is he writes our books. He's in our comic. We've done animation with him with Cosmo and uh, some other projects. So we've used him as uh, essentially a storytelling me mm -hmm. a mechanism or tool uh, to be able to reach kids. And, and that kind of played in my, my work experience played into what I'm doing now, mm -hmm. because in all these fields, I mean, you've been in, in science and, mm -hmm. and uh, in this field for a long time. And uh, your company is very unique uh, in the, the team that you've developed, but that is not typically what you mm -hmm. see outside, mm -hmm. right? Often in these projects, even at entry level, but it got worse as I got into the executive right. level, mm -hmm. diversity doesn't really exist yeah. uh, in science and tech. I, I'd, oftentimes I'd be the only person, uh, definitely usually the only Hispanic that was mm -hmm. on the project and sometimes the only person that had any kind of diversity background at all. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm on a project. And the reality is technology is where income is generated the most. These STEM fields, that's mm -hmm. where the highest salaries are. Those are the jobs that don't get affected by 
climate change or pandemics, right? Where the jobs that can easily transition to being done over Zoom as opposed mm -hmm. to having to go into work and, and exposing yourself besides medical, but having to do uh, things like, you know, going to the grocery store and packing mm -hmm. the shelves or working at, a, working at a fast food place and having to be there and having to make sure that the economy is still functioning, being a, uh, you know, transferring goods. Realistically, the, the higher paying jobs are the STEM jobs. And if we don't inspire kids from underserved communities, to go into those fields, then that inequality will continue to be perpetuated. So mm -hmm. that's really the the what kind of the the magic or the the impetus behind uh, developing at Astra is we want to create content that's inspirational kids from all walks of life, regardless mm -hmm. of what they look like, regardless of their skin color, regardless of their gender, their gender identity, their neurodiversity, regardless of if they have any kind of disability, that they can see themselves in some sort of field in STEM. And we want to do that with popular media because that's how kids mm -hmm. start creating mm -hmm. concepts of who they can be and what they can be. They, they start dreaming. It's like the, yeah. I think the perfect personification of it is that viral image that went around recently of the little boy who thought the movie Encanto uh, was about yeah. him because he saw himself. He saw yeah. another little boy with darker skin with, yeah. uh, with his, his, the same hair that okay. he had. Uh -huh. He's like, Oh, this movie must be about me. Yeah. Um, and that's what we're looking to do. Mm -hmm. um, every When I came out, I was like, that's exactly what we're looking to do. We yeah. want to create stuff that kids see themselves in, but when they see themselves, they see themselves as the doctor or the right. engineer or the environmental scientist. So that when they start dreaming about what they're going to be, that those are the things that they see themselves and that's how they direct their lives. So our mission is it's uh it's multi-decades to see the outcome, but uh, no one else is doing it and it mm -hmm. needs to be done. So when something it, does, it absolutely needs to be done, no question whatsoever. And what I love about the the way you've crafted the entire sort of um, Ad Astra ecosystem, I guess, if you will, is the fact that because you've done it through media and through the notion that we can use media to not just teach, but to entertain. And quite frankly, from the past perspective, we're talking about engaging kids where they are. That's one of the things that I really, really love about this. Um, you know, your point being that, um, you know, the media is, is it's, um, it's highly accessible in many, many respects, right? And so when you get sort of into that technology space and the notion that, you know, long-term, it can be a portal through which you can actually pipeline kids into that dream, that's that's absolutely fabulous. And, you know, full transparency for our listeners, you know, the part of the work that PAST has specifically with Ad Astra Media is we partnered um, with Jose and his team around um, a series of books, um, Good Night Little, and we'll get him to share with us just a little bit about that um, here in a minute. But it was really about helping the, our littlest learners, our preschool kiddos, see themselves in potential STEAM and STEM careers, which we at PASS just truly, truly love. And we get to play in that space because we were working on um, the activities and the modules to go with these, these books and these characters that Jose and his team had already um, spent so much time working on. So let's dig just a little bit, Jose, into the variety of content that you're creating because you talked about Dr. Intergalactic and you, there's comic strips and there's books and um, it's music. I mean, it's going a lot of different directions at once, which yeah. is pretty cool. So talk to us a little bit about some of those offerings and sort of the why. That's the thing that's most curious to me is like, so why Good Night Little? Why Cares? Why the comic strips? You have very particular intentions with each one of these. Yeah, for sure. Um, and it all comes from experiences within our team and within mm -hmm. life in general. Um, the Good Night series. So we're a transmedia company. So we produce content uh, in all forms. We produce digital, we do animations, 2D, 3D, mm -hmm. we've done some AR work and we're starting to do more VR work with individuals. And then we have print content, both books and comics. The, the reason why the scope of the content is because when you're trying to reach underserved kids, uh, there's still a digital divide mm -hmm. to get into mm -hmm. consideration um, that not everyone has access to broadband. Not everyone has access to the internet. That's still a reality within even the quote unquote richest country in the world, right? The United States. So right. being able to create content that can reach kids where they are, regardless of their socioeconomic status, um, is our core. And our team is, is like that as well. Um, the Good Night series came out of uh, really old golden books. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm mm -hmm. sure some of your audience probably oh, yeah. knows golden books. It's what I kind of grew up mm -hmm. with. 
Yeah. Um, so I remember reading Good Night Little Bear and uh, the team sat down and were like, oh, wouldn't it be great if we did something like this, but just showed diverse STEM uh, careers and getting the kids to dream about they could be themselves or what they could be in the future. So every uh, every different book uh, has a different STEM career mm-hmm. and we have a different diverse character uh, in it. In the long in the long term, we want to create you know as many as we can possibly create in it. But then eventually, we want to turn these uh, this whole into like a little classroom, and they're going they're going to go on little missions, almost like mm-hmm. a magic school bus kind of thing. Uh, so that's kind of a long term. Uh, for that project. And then the other aspect is when you're creating content for kids, uh, they change over time, how Mm -hmm. kids learn over time. You you guys are world renowned experts on this. So the type of content that a four to six year old likes or a three to five year old likes Mm -hmm. is going to be very different than the type of content that someone that's in the bridge group or someone that's in the, uh, you know, in the 11 to tween age group. And then as you get older, the content has to, has to change, has to mature. So that's the the concept of why we create content in, in different at different levels and in different perspectives. Uh, the graphic novels we have are more geared towards older kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a diverse group of kids in in that as well. Each one of them has a power of STEAM: science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. They all come from diverse religions, ethnicities, uh, neurodiversity, genders, gender identity, um, and essentially they go up into space and they learn about their power. Um, but they also start fighting using those powers to fight ignorance and ignorance mm-hmm. that comes in all forms. And we actually have a villain now who's the personification of ignorance, uh, Dr. Krang, um, and they fight him and, um, and the things that the kids face throughout and we as adults face throughout our lives, ignorance of things like anti-Semitism, misogyny, racism, those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, that is just, just comes out of ignorance. And we're, mm-hmm. we're trying to fight that with knowledge essentially. Um, and then the, the care series is really about mental health. So knowing that mm-hmm. one of the things that, uh, tends to hold all of us back, but something that we don't talk a, a lot about with our children is mental health. And, mm-hmm. uh, specifically for young boys where there's a, this concept that men have to have some form of, you know, super masculinity mm-hmm. that ends up being toxic in a lot of ways mm-hmm. that ends up at the end of the day, holding and, di- and dividing us because mm-hmm. then you, oh, well, these fields are for men and it shouldn't be for women or it shouldn't be for men that don't, don't act like we do. Mm-hmm. So it's, t- it's trying to break down those barriers that then end up leading to a lot of negative things throughout all of society that um, have affected people in, in our in our company and have affected probably mm-hmm. many women that we know and that are listening right now. And mm-hmm. those are the kinds of things that we're, we're yeah. trying to fight specifically. Yeah. Um, but we even have, we have shows on, uh, we have our space racers content that's now on Amazon primed. Um, yeah. We have our first two seasons there. We're now on Hulu and Roku. Um, we're going to be working on our first live action this summer uh, short film that we're going to be doing around mm-hmm. space and science. Um, and we have some other kind of shows that are being developed in collaboration with other animation studios uh, that we're super excited about. And we even have some metaverse projects that are starting to be developed now as well, some digital worlds that we're starting to create for, for people. So we're getting, we're, it's, it's getting, a, it's, it's a lot. It's a, there's a lot going on and there's a lot of uh, content both on our website as well that's free for mm-hmm. people to use. So we are a social impact company. We are generating revenue and we, we are um, becoming sustainable, but we also are firm believers and you have to give back mm-hmm. um, just as much as you get. So we have a lot of content that's freely available for teachers, for homeschoolers uh, on our website as well. You're busy. Yeah, that's, that's what running a company <laughs> is. Running a company is being busy. Yeah, my goodness, that's a lot of stuff. Um, it, it is it's, a, it's a great diversity of things that you're doing, though. Sure, yeah, but again, it's not. It's not like I'm. You know, we have a creative team. Yeah. It's not like I'm. I'm writing everything and I'm <laughs> animating everything. Um, I get to do this. I mm-hmm. get to sit with amazing people like you, um, and then work on collaborations. Work on trying to um, build the because it takes a village. We can do our small part. But it, there's a bunch of folks that need to do their part. Like you, if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be able to do our educational modules. Right, so right. Um, we need your skill set and your know-how to be able to, to do those kinds of things. We can bring our, our skills to the table, but we can't be everything. Um, yeah. So. 
Yeah, and nobody can. Well, and let's dig into that just a little bit because a, a, a huge uh, percentage of our audience are, are, are educators. They're, they're teachers, they're administrators, they're community members who are really looking to churn change um, the direction um, and, and the potential impact in their communities through high quality education, especially at a time, um, you know, um, in this sort of quasi post pandemic, not really a world that we're living in, despite what everybody wants to talk about. Um, yeah. You know, the reality is there was a tremendous amount of disruption that's taken place. And we have this uh, incredible opportunity to, quite frankly, um, this, this is honestly speaking here, not go back to what was. It wasn't working. We know it wasn't working. It was largely obsolete. So we we have this, this opportunity. And, you know, one of the things that we've very deliberately done um, with, with, with Ad Astra, uh, particularly with a good night um, little series is that we were trying to not just build high quality um, activities and modules, but we wanted to make sure that we were very, very deliberately testing them and engaging them prior to those being released. I do want to talk about that just a little bit, Jose, because one of the pushbacks that happens often from educators when new, great, cool content comes out is, well, this is fine and it's fun, but it doesn't have this high level or quality of sort of educational fidelity that we want to be able to take then use and adopt directly into the classroom. And we've, you and I talked about that um, when we first, first got started with this endeavor around, you know, how do we ensure that that's not going to be the case and that there can be broad adoption of the material, the content, the stories, the opportunity that Ad Astra is putting out and that we can in fact sort of change um, what's happening. And one of the ways that we're doing this has been by sort of thinking about testing and asking questions as we're building the modules and engaging teachers and practitioners with us at every step of the way. So um, share with us just a little bit with our listeners, Jose, sort of from your perspective about why that sort of appealed to you and how you're leveraging that. I'm thinking about what's kind of going on in a couple of the states that we, we've been talking about working in some bigger distribution. So share some of those conversations sort of from the Ad Astra perspective, if you will. Yeah, well, the concept that we had and when we approached you uh, with it, 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 a vision for our content is that we're we're on the entertainment side and we mm. we capti- we captivate the kids uh, with interesting characters and stories and things that they can see themselves in. But we want this to because we live in this transmedia world, we want this to go beyond uh, just the way they receive it at home. So it's our our perspectives that informal science. Mm-hmm. Uh, education and informal science kind of captivation. Uh, But this needs to translate into things that can be then taken into the schools because we want the kids to be able to see the reflection of who they are in these characters at all times. We want to be having that positive reinforcement of, hey, you can be in science. Hey, you can do this. Uh, Scientists do look like you. They do Mm -hmm. speak like you. They do come from your backgrounds. Because we know that um, kids specifically in early age groups there tends to be a pretty good diversity on how kids like to do science and who likes to do math, but we tend to lose kids, especially as they grow up mm-hmm. into, into uh, middle school and high mm-hmm. school specifically. We lose a lot of girls. We lose a lot of LGBTQ plus um, friends. We lose uh, a lot of BIPOC kids who don't see themselves mm-hmm. being able to do these things. It's usually social things that cause right. that. It's right. not the skills. The skills never change. Their skills were on par or better mm-hmm. than everybody else. But there's all these social dynamics that make them feel like, oh, though these aren't the people that I'm supposed to be a part of. I'm supposed to be doing other things. Mm-hmm. Science and math are supposed to be, you know, other people and not right. us. So we want to have our characters that go into educational content so that the kids can see themselves. So that's why working with past and the way you guys craft, you are teachers. You, know, mm-hmm. you come from that background. You mm-hmm. come, and not just from an education background, you come from a, a humanism background. Like you have your, the concepts and the way that you develop it are at such high level for every age group. It just mm-hmm. It's just the perfect blend of high educational understanding that's being developed by educators for educators mm-hmm. and that we're just bringing our storytelling and our diverse characters into that so that whether it's, 
hands-on educational modules that can be done mm -hmm. uh, within the classroom or within a homeschool selling setting or the hybrid setting or in the future i'm sure uh, we can also have digital types of yeah. education mm -hmm. that can absolutely put into those as well so that's where it's i feel like it's a perfect combination because we're not educators we're storytellers mm -hmm. so com combining with your expertise and your skill set i think that's when you start and that's in general, how you develop great innovation, mm -hmm. you bring different mm -hmm. groups to the table to have different skill sets, and then you develop something very new and very novel that ends up getting a lot of great feedback from mm -hmm. everybody. We're, we're talking with um, different groups in Virginia, uh, the WHRO, which is mm -hmm. uh, one of NPR and PBS's um, affiliates here uh, in Eastern Virginia, about getting our content to every public school mm -hmm. throughout Virginia. Mm -hmm. We're talking to distributors uh, up in the tri-state tri area of New Jersey, New York. Um, and then we're also talking with distributors in Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. uh, both the private and public sector there, and also uh, with distributors down in Texas. Uh, so we have a lot of ongoing conversations to get our content into very, some of the largest school districts mm -hmm. uh, in the country, which is really exciting. And, um, you know, once this content gets out to the kids, that's the goal. The goal is for them to see themselves. And the feedback that we get from teachers, the feedback that we get from uh, distributors, everyone, once they hear about us, they're mm -hmm. like, what have you been? Like, this yeah. is amazing. Yeah. Like, we yeah. want to be working with you. And it's a lot of fun. And I would also add for our readers, um, um, at least the, the Good Night series, and I know many of the other sort of elements that you're working on across the, the entire ecosystem that is at Astra is, is oftentimes multilingual. And that's super, super exciting. And that was the other thing that we were absolutely jazzed about is because we we know that um, not only do kids need to see themselves in characters for for engagement, but they also need to to see and be and experience those characters across a variety of cultural sort of personas. And that includes language. It includes the day to day understanding of what that particular cultural group brings to um, the scientific endeavor. And you're able to do that because of the way you 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 couch and craft those things things. I, I did want to share with you, um, you know, one of the things that we've seen, because as we are working on developing the activities in the modules, not only are we testing them, but we're, we're literally testing them on our own children um, within the, the team and, and the staff, but also within, you know, direct content um, and connections with the community. And we do see some really interesting sort of things. So, for example, when we were working on a good night little doctor, so uh, there's a little boy. This cute little boy, um, lots and lots of fun, um, who was really intrigued by Goodnight Little Doctor, so intrigued that, um, and we were doing this in the late, late summer, uh, last summer, that when Halloween came around, this child wanted to be a doctor. And not just did he want to be a doctor because of having, you know, been exposed to Goodnight Little Doctor, but he wanted to be, you're going to love this, Jose, he wanted to be a doctor with a beard. <laughs> Yeah, that is, awesome. uh, that is cute. And, and then so and he was and I and I and I saw photos, the family sent us photos so that we could sort of see what the what this little doctor was off in the world doing. So this little boy, not only did he want to be a doctor with a beard for Halloween and he was all of that. But at Christmas, then he he asked for stuff so he could see inside his body. And I thought that was amazing. And this little boy is only about two year, two and a half years old. Um, so in that really sort of young sort of space of trying to figure all of these different pieces and components out. And so it's exactly, you know, some of the stuff that his family got him for Christmas were um, these little puzzles that were all about how you put a human body together and all of those different pieces. And then the most recent sort of example of the iterations, and this is what I love about this opportunity, is, you know, a child got introduced to this particular career, this concept, they could find themselves in there, figure out how they could be that thing, and then be able to sort of scale that themselves by asking for more. I want to learn some more very organically. But um, most recently, I saw a photograph, actually, the family sent of this child um, with a stethoscope, because one of the things also, you know, in addition to wanting to, you know, puzzles of the inside of the body was where the tools. So, you know, lots of those things that you can order online and whatnot. And, um, but this child, child actually was uh, standing at a beehive, right, with a stethoscope on, trying to hear the bees inside. 
So now this is an iteration of utilizing the tools and the technology for a completely different application. And in my mind, Jose, that's the win. Oh, 100%. That is so amazing. Yes. That is, yes, that is the win. Yeah. And I, I just, and I love that. And, you know, one of the other things that we've been able to do um, with a variety of the different sort of pieces is, you know, because we're testing these all the time as we're getting them ready to ship off to your team to do their incredible magic, to get them ready to actually go, go to families, go to homeschools, go, go to schools, what, whatever is we, we also get to use these, these um, materials and these maker mania events that we, we do at pass, which are an awful lot of fun. And we do them for, for young kids, elementary uh, kids, mainly. Um, and we've got these, these kids that we see month after month after month, they come back over and over and over again. And we hear their families tell us all the time they like to come to these events because they get to play and they get to play in an unfettered environment with a variety, a great diversity of people, and they can find something that appeals to them. And what's really fun for me is that we get to see those same kids go from good night, little doctor activities to good night, little veterinarian to good night, little astronaut to good night, little aviator. And you see that same kid having that wow opportunity every single time that to me is is really powerful yeah that it makes me very happy <laughs> um uh that you say this and that's and th those are the types of responses that we get to see and that's really what what i love the most mm -hmm. and do, when we go to our events and we when kids see themselves mm -hmm. And they're like, I've never seen that before. I've never seen someone that looks like me as a doctor. I, and we hear that it's it's heartbreaking in a way, but then it's also like validating as well. Mm -hmm. All right, we are on the right track. And I think, well, one of one of the I always get emotional, so I apologize if, if I get emotional on this call because I always I'm a very emotional guy. Um, but when I had a I had a great conversation, great opportunity to speak with um, uh, Bill. Uh, Bill Ayers, who he um, he was uh, previously uh, the president of the Fred Rogers mm -hmm. uh, production company, Bill Eisler, uh, Fred Rogers production company. Now he is the chairman. He's retired. He's um, no longer active role and just sits on the board. Um, but I was able to speak with him and have a conversation with him in Pittsburgh. We were talking about what we were doing. Um, and his words to me were, you know, I don't, I don't like to speak. Um, I don't like to speak for someone who's passed away, but um, I'd like to say, Jose, that if, if Fred was alive, he would be very proud of what you're doing. And I was like, mm. if we're good enough for Mr. Rogers, <laughs> I think, I think we're doing okay. I think we're doing okay. Um, so that's, that's the goal. And, and kids, when they see it, they just, they just light up mm -hmm. and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to, we're trying to give kids dreams. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the core of our company is getting them to dream about what they can be and understand that regardless of what society has given them, that they can do whatever they, that they want to do. And um, because that's the one thing that no one can take away from you. No one can take away. From you. So that's what we're trying to, to do for, for the kids. And it's amazing. And it's awesome that we get to do that. Um, so that's, that's kind of, I and mean, you talked about uh, multilingual content. Uh, obviously, I, my first language is mm -hmm. Spanish. Mm -hmm. So everything we started creating was, was Spanish and English to start with. And then one of our partners said, hey, would you be able to do both languages in, in some of your content? I was like, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So our books have the bilingual Spanish and English. Um, and then we actually started creating uh, our content in Dari and Pashto. Mm -hmm. Um, which are the two most common, commonly spoken dialects from Afghanistan. And, and the core from that was actually the recent pullout that, that we had. And we had a, a lot of refugees coming mm -hmm. over to, mm -hmm. to the United States, but not just the U.S. It's really all mm -hmm. over the world mm -hmm. where they've been displaced. Um, but the team got together like, well, you know, what can we do to mm -hmm. try to help? So we said, why don't we just start translating our content into, mm -hmm. and that was the first, the first dialects we did outside of Spanish. Um, and it's so rare that we, 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 we put our content through Amazon and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Walmart and Target, you can get our content anywhere, any e-commerce, but Amazon actually doesn't even have um, those dialects, it doesn't recognize them as languages. So it, it, we have to kind of find workarounds to allow us to be able to actually print in Dari and Pashto. Um, and we have bilinguals that have Dari in English mm -hmm. and Pashto in English. And they and families love it because no one is paying attention to 
to to them no one's creating content for them right, so right. when they see it, they're like oh you know they're in they're in a strange country they don't they hardly speak the language and they, and and they finally see something that gives them kind of a sense of home right mm-hmm. so just very simple things like that so that's that's the kind of, and eventually we want to translate to all languages but uh we're still small so that's a lot of work so yeah. Sure. yeah it's good but it's it is you know super super meaningful and i appreciate that component so much because you know it it, it and we say this all the time it passed it's not just enough to to see people that look like you you have to be able to see yourself you know if i if it, you know um that sort of you, you can see her you can be her sort of thing that's in, in media right now a lot which I, I appreciate and it's fabulous but it's not enough right because because not only do you need to see yourself but you also need to be able to see the possibility of what could be right and for that you need to be able to to have a, a great opportunity to explore a variety of different skills um and career opportunities and 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 things which is one of the reasons why you know again I love the content that you're doing because, you know, a kid can go from a good night little doctor to a good night little veterinarian to good night little astronomer, right? And can just really just sort of move through the, all of these different sort of lenses of exploration and through that exploration, see a variety of different people, um, little kids in that case, right? You know, who are in that role of to potentially okay. be able to identify with from a different um, and, a, and a variety of opportunities. And so that's one of the pieces, quite frankly, that really really um, appeals to be um, in that space as well. So um, Jose, I want to thank you very much um, for taking time to uh, talk with us today. Um, And most importantly, to thank you very much for everything that you do, because um, the work that is happening as a result of Ad Astra Media is spectacular, and it is going to um, make a difference in the world. So thank you for joining us today. Appreciate it, Annalise. Thank you so much. Absolutely.